All right. Um, first of all, I would like to ask you, Felix, is Richard Branson a investor in Amen? Uh, no. <laughs> you, you just go on vacation with him, is that it? Uh, my co-founder was. <laughs> she, um, she was on a sailing trip in the Caribbean with uh, David Karp, the founder of um, um, Tumblr. Oh. And then uh, apparently um, his assistant, he's an investor in Tumblr, so the assistant called and said, why don't you come over and have lunch? The rest of the story she has to say, she ended up with a, with a ticket to space, so that wasn't the worst lunch, <laughs> I guess. Awesome. All right, so um, the three startups on stage here today um, all represent new, uh, new business models, new ways of doing business that we didn't see like just five, ten years ago. Like terminologies or things like crowdsourcing, things like crowdfunding, uh, things like mobile, social aware, local apps. We, we didn't see any of these uh, business models uh, just five, ten years ago. And we also see today, we also see companies that can arise from nothing. You can basically go out together with a few friends and build a new company and get customers more or less from one day to the other. So um, in many ways, you are the next big thing here. This, you, you represent a new way of of doing business. Um, do you see yourself when you, when you build your companies? Were, was it with deliberate, uh, uh, like, with, was it deliberately about creating a new big thing here, or are you very much kind of a digital native that, that does things kind of because you can do it? <laughs> Well, I don't, I don't think you wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to create the next Google or next Facebook. It's all about, the way we see it is, is, is about solving a problem that concerns everyone. And um, as I mentioned in my opening, is uh, anyone, has ever, anyone who's ever operated a machine or software knows uh, that there's always has errors. And we tend to find workarounds, you know, whether it be, uh, you know, if you, if you look at some people in the office, how they work, and find their own workarounds to, um, you know, circumvent the, the software bugs and errors they have. Uh, it, it's more of a fundamental thing to ask yourself, how, do we, how can we tackle the ori origin of the problem instead of you know, uh, saying, okay, how, how can we make a big thing? How can we be, become rich quickly? It's more about, I think it's, uh, I used to work for Google before, and it always says, focus on the user and everything else will follow. And that, uh, that, that's something that applies to a lot of business models, that you just concentrate on solving a bigger problem, not becoming a big thing, but solving a big problem. But what was your inspiration for building a business basically built around crowdsourcing? It's, you know, the most prominent example of crowdsourcing is Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. you know, it's the collective intelligence, something great um, that evolved out of a lot of people working on the same project. And the question was, why not do the same thing for products that we all use and, you know, that need to be tested anyway, so, you know, concentrate on putting the humans into the development, putting the intelligence and our favors, our usability, our preferences into a product that becomes ultimately something great because we, we were part of it. Mm. And when, when we look at um, the feedback we get from our crowd, it's, it's amazing it's, uh, how proud they actually feel to be part of a, an early development product that hasn't been out, released yet and their, their opinion gets valued and they're being respected. Because a while ago, a few years ago, if you look at crowdsourcing, it used to be mainstream, everything. Now you see crowdsourcing being more focused. You know, you have crowdfunding, you have crowdsourcing in certain fields. Uh, it's, it, it, even Chibo is uh, crowdsourcing. Uh, I think a, a McDonald's a hamburger has been crowdsourced. Uh, Nokia's ringtone has been crowdsourced. So it's amazing examples out there that prove that this model is actually something that helps the business to listen to the consumer and actually create a product that's, you know, that we all were part of. So going from crowdsourcing to crowdfunding, so can you uh, uh, applaud to, can you tell a little bit more about the business model and uh, the inspiration for creating this, this uh, crowdfunding uh, startup? Yeah, it's basically coming back to your first question. I, I think that um, you don't, like, like you said, necessarily get up in the morning with the idea, I'm gonna create the next big thing. I think it's, it's rather, um, Having the idea feels like a gift, you know, that you are being given, you know? And then it depends on your skills if you can actually turn around. Mm. <clears throat> and uh, with, with the plot too, you know, it, it was, a, was a personal moment, you know, when, when I was sitting in the office in 2006 and um, listening to, to web radio while working away, um, there was a song from Underworld that I didn't know. 
and um, I um, really wanted to buy it on Amazon or iTunes, you know, but um, <clears throat> I couldn't get it because I didn't have it. Um, and then 10 minutes later, I had it on, on my system anyhow. So if this is being broadcasted, you know, the police, here I am. Um, Gamer hates me anyhow, but um, um, then, you know, I started thinking about this, this whole thing, you know, music industry, musicians, DJs, and actors, and, and I figured out, hey, there's this, like, like a, a, a massive um, disconnection, you know, between the industry and what it is all about. And I thought it's it's time to refocus, you know, and 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 get a different grasp on on what is music actually worth. And I think the guys who should really determine what music is worth are those who are paying for it, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's basically what what the plot is all about. That that you it, it's based on voluntary appreciation. So you can you decide if you want to support the guy that uh, you love the music he's playing. You know, or the actor who, who's who's acting. So, so that's a simple simple idea. It's a bit tough to turn around, but uh, <laughs> uh, how will you make money on that? It's it's actually very simple. You know, it's tipping the waiter. You know, if if, if you can, if, if if I can invite um, like uh, Paul van Dyk or or Henrik Schwartz, you know, for for virtual espresso. Uh, and when, when we're checking out, you know, we were just saying, okay, if you, if you like the fact that you, you can support your, your guy directly, uh, do the same as you do in, in, the, in, the, in the pub or in the, in the cafe, you know, tip the waiter. So it's, it's again, our uh, business model is voluntary appreciation. So, so that's, that's, that's the main thing. All right, cool. Um, Felix, you, um, you're like an experienced entrepreneur. You had a business before, you sold a business, and now you created a new business. Do you have, like, we also talk about disruptive, like, new ways of building companies, of building businesses, and so on. Do you have, do you have any insight? Do you know exactly, or do you know the uh, neighborhood of how much did it actually cost you to launch Am a Amen, your new app? Well, I mean, the, the cost, of launching a company has gone down to zero. Yeah. I, mean, I think we all know that. Um, uh, it still doesn't mean that um, the cost to succeed is zero. Um, <laughs> that's the problem here. Um, no, I mean, I, I, there was definitely, you know, in, in the first wave in 99, you know, usually what you did is you, there was a bunch of, bunch of business students who raised money and then they outsourced the creation of the actual company to an agency, which seems bizarre these days, actually. Um, and then 2004, even then, you know, I mean, there was, there was still, there was less cloud-based infrastructure. So, I mean, we all know these things. So, 2004, when we started Places, there was still a little bit of cost involved in terms of, um, uh, in, in, in terms of, you know, having an ops guy and things like that. And now you have companies like Engine Yard that take care of that kind of stuff. Um, even what you didn't have in 2004, of course, was the software cost. So, that started with, um, with um, um, open source to go away, basically. So, the, the cost is zero. But um, what's kind of interesting is because that is the case, you cannot, you know, keep yourself busy with things anymore. You know, I mean, there used to be this, this um, when you started a company, you know, this, this thing with the to-do list that, you know, it's not a linear list thing, but there's important and urgent things and, you know, urgent and not so important things and so on and so forth. It used to be very easy to think, I did everything I could to make this company successful just because you were busy, you know, you were like organizing money to buy the licenses and, you know, organizing the service and this and that and, you know, hiring the marketing guy. You did a bunch of crap, but in the end you didn't do the stuff that was important to make it successful in the internet social space. So with Amen, it's, it's, it's such a pure play in a way that basically um, there is no, there's no hiding behind things, you know, we don't do biz dev, we, we don't, we don't, we're not hoping for the big deal with some mobile operator, we're, you know, we're not doing marketing, it all simply doesn't matter for a model like Amen, it's pretty binary. Um, there's other models, of course, when you do e-commerce where, where it's a well-understood business model, but we need to basically figure out that model and with this social stuff, it's, we all know this. I mean, there is some app that for some reason is addictive and you use all the time. There's another app that for some reason, even though it's beautiful or you know you kind of liked it in the beginning, you end up not using it. And I think in the, in the last couple of years, there's been a lot of research and a lot of more deeper understanding of why certain things become addictive, why they work, you know, all these things around sort of human motivation and you know, the cost of zero that you know, it's not really, uh, just because something is free doesn't mean it comes without cost, you know, it's still the cost of your time and getting into that very little set of four or five apps that people have on their mobile phone that they use all the time and form that habit 
is an incredibly hard thing to do. So on the one hand, the actual monetary cost and the logistic cost of starting a company has gone down to zero, but it's also exposed almost painfully um, you know, that it's not so easy to get this right and that only you know, maybe one out of 100 companies gets it right. So yeah. it's, we are just razor sharp focused on um, turning these little knobs and like wondering, okay, if we, if we change the feed mechanic a little bit here, if we change the follow model a little bit there, what will it do? Because it is these small things that in the end tip it. So what was your magic sauce to getting the initial traction and the initial attention around Eamon? Well, I mean, I think I think one of the one of the things that that have become clear understood is that in the end, you know, everyone wants to get to virality, of course. You know, I mean, it's all about sort of organic growth, and that you know, um, you 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 have this 10, 15 percent um, up on all KPIs every month, and then you know, okay, this formula works. Mm -hmm. um, I don't I don't think we're there yet, um, but basically, it's two things that you have to do. Like, I, you have to start with the actual. Um, usefulness and fun and you know basically stickiness of the app because you know it's like in real virality the you know the the, the size of the infectious population is the number one factor um, so if people try out your app and a lot of people download them and that's what you get with the initial hype you know I mean a lot of people have criticized us for like creating a lot of hype it's fine if you do that uh, you just don't don't mistake that for success you know I mean if you have an initial hundred thousand people running in and trying out the app the question is, what do they do one month later, two months later, three months later? What does the retention look like? Yeah. And we've been very focused on making sure that, you know, we've, we even said, because, you know, my co-founder is the guy who, who built Twitter, and he brought that to the table. He said, you know what we did at Twitter in the beginning? We said, screw the people that don't get this. <laughs> um, because basically, if you try to, you know, cater to the people that don't understand it, like we did at places, make it easier and easier, you don't have enough time and enough resources to cater to the people who actually like your app, right? So this time we did it like at Twitter. We basically said, hey, you know, we look, if we're looking at the behavior of the people that do two posts. Like once you've done two posts, apparently you get it, apparently you kind of like it, you were interested enough. So what is that person doing eight weeks later? And we just concentrated on keeping those people and keeping the activity high, making sure that with every session they post at least three things, have like low friction and higher friction ways of interacting with the system. It's really almost like a chemical formula. Okay. And once you have that figured out, once you have enough people using it on a regular basis, then you can worry about like how to spread it, you know, optimize conversion rates and these kind of things. But it's a very systematic approach actually. Just, just to quickly build on that, because uh, what Felix says about that uh, the, the cost of starting something is really close to zero. I mean, it's not really zero, but it's like so much cheaper than we had before. So why do they need your money? Pardon? Why do they need your money? Well, <laughs> get, guess what? There are some 22-year-old kids uh, who don't even are able to afford a German GmbH with the 25K or something. And, and that's where they need the money. But, but, but I can come question. back to that. Do they need your advice or do they need your money, first of all? Uh, me personally? No, the companies that you are, that you are consulting and, and, and uh, it's, funding. It's, it's really dependent on what stage they are. Like, um, you know, I, I teach at Lake Constance at Zeppelin University and uh, I've, I've, I've co-founded a company there and when I've been to the notary, um, actually when they said about the birth date, I'm born in 72 and the guy next to me was born in 92. So I was like, <laughs> damn, I have 92. You're so old. I, I felt, first of all, I felt old, but on the other hand, you know, they were born in 92, so they never been to the notary before. Um, they, they, they don't have the cash on the bank account to, uh, you know, to, to get started. And so, f for instance, for a founder like this, they are actually looking for advice and for money and for contacts. And then, of course, there are the seasoned guys uh, who maybe are, are doing their second or third, and they have complete opposites, of course. It, it might be different connections, uh, it might be bigger uh, access to money. But uh, coming back to, to what I've just said with, with Felix, because it's so uh, becoming so incredibly easy to start a company, your first question was about um, did you had actually in mind to build the next big thing? And I think that's where actually the challenge is not to think about that. Because those companies I've seen fail, what they've, uh, you know, where I personally lost money, and most of the times um, they, they were too, uh, obsessed with like making the product perfect as stupid as it sounds because you can f infinitely go to to testings and to uh, you know twist and tweak and never get the product out and then basically it's too late <laughs> it's two different things i agree with you on perfection but i mean if you build a company then why would you not want it to be big 
I, I, mean, I, 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 that, I, I mean, I don't understand why you're like, I mean. No, what I mean with that is what I've, what I've seen happening is like, um, they, they've been so driven by their vision that they're keeping adding stuff to their product. Like, oh, we need to do this and uh, we need to have like a tablet version and oh, we should go to social TV and oh, let's do something for the car as well. But they never actually got one product out in the market. They never get some real feedback from users before. And then they basically fail without having even one guy using the service. That's what I meant with the diversion. You know, it keeps you busy to do an Android version, to do a That's tablet right. version. Like we, just, we just turned off web. It was a big, you know, big shitstorm online, you know, by our users. Like, why, how can you do this? And now you can only use it with iOS. But basically, if you're not, um, if you don't figure, if you can't figure it out for one platform, then why do two? I think that's one of the classic mm. mistakes too. Like, oh, mm, we're not growing fast enough on iOS, so let's do Android. Like, why the hell would you grow faster on Android, right? It's just pick one platform and stick with it. And if you found the formula, then then yeah. you can. It's like with languages, right? It's like, oh, we don't. It doesn't work in Germany. Let's go to the U.S. I mean, what? You know, there's no logic there. But you can say I've tried everything and you know, be very busy, basically. All right, uh, Nate. So, seen from seen from New York. Uh, and everywhere else in the world where you live. <laughs> what, so we talked about a bunch of, of kind of trends for new technology companies today. We've talked about Enterprise 2.0, we talked about uh, you know, social, we talked about mobile, we talked about crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, that's the whole consumerization of IT. We have a, like a new focus on the user experience. That's all the, the ubiquitous networking, ubiquitous computing. All of these things are changing everything dramatically right now. Kind of, how will you stack rank, uh, <laughs> see, see, see from your chair, how will you stack rank kind of these uh, paradigm changes? All, all those different technologies. And, um, I, actually, I, I wouldn't. <laughs> and, and I, think, I think focusing on that stuff is one of the biggest problems that, that we're seeing companies make right now. And when you worry about mobile versus social, when you worry about the technology behind it, then you're not worried about what's really important mm. to, to becoming successful. And the companies that, that walked the door and talked to us about um, how they're using a technology platform or how they're using technology in general are the ones who I think have a hard time. Um, if you're focused on this platform versus that or this technology change versus that, then you're missing the opportunity to solve people's problems. Yeah. Right? And so when I think about the companies that do well, the companies that succeed, they're the ones that are focused less on the technology and more on using the technology invisibly, if at all possible, to, to, to get things done for their customers. And sometimes that means using technology invisibly to, to get stuff done for consumers, um, like Amen, right? It, it's mobile, and that's great. You can use it for a mobile device. That's fantastic. That's not the point. Yeah. The point is I can share my opinions, and other people can find my opinions. That's why it's useful. If it's, you know, if it's software testing, um, the fact that it's crowdsourcing is part of what makes it work. But what makes it interesting to the buyer is that it's a better way to do something they're already trying to do. And it, it sounds incredibly simple, and then 99% of the companies that we talk to miss that point. Um, don't worry about what's underneath the hood nearly as much as you worry about solving somebody's problems. And if you can do that, then that's the first step. So, like, the, the theme that we also got introduced this morning is kind of beyond digital, beyond technology. Um, but isn't that, isn't that a little bit, like, at least for some of us, like, you know, I'm also from 70 something. <laughs> and, and for us, like computer, I think about my iPhone as a computer, whereas my kids, they think about it as their, you know, game, movie thing, machine hips. So they are much more like a digital native than I will ever be. Isn't it, isn't it, isn't it complicated for people in our generation to think kind of beyond the technology? When you, when you, when you build Amen, isn't it like, isn't it hard to disconnect kind of the thing that you want to do from the technology? Um, no, no, I don't think so. I mean, of course, you look at you look at certain practicalities, and you know, you have a short discussion around, you know, what is the better platform to to develop for, and but it's all just about you know what is the what is the biggest bang for the buck or the shortest way of getting from A to B, and then you pick a platform and you, and, and you stick with it. We could as well have done Android. You could do Amen completely web-based. I mean, it's nice, of course, you have your phone in your hand. We were more thinking about, when we thought about mobile, it's like, when do people have their experiences? So we think that the creation side is more on mobile, the consumption side is more on web. But, um, yeah, no, I mean, um, 
So if it, if it I, wasn't for iPhones or Androids, would you have built the same exact service just on, on the internet? Uh, not exactly the same, but, but fairly similar. I mean, what's really cool is on, on mobile, you can work with ambient clues, right? Mm. So when you talk about a place, for example, and you say post an opinion about a place, we already pull in places from Foursquare. So, you know, you don't have to type, yeah. right? Um, on the web, you have similar things to gather ambient clues, which like with a bookmarklet where you could say, you know, aim in this or pin this, we all know that. Um, and then, you know, if it's a YouTube video, you already have metadata from the page, whether you get the metadata from, you know, the, the, the ether, or whether you get that, you know, in the browser from the page structure, doesn't really matter. It's, 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 um, it's, it's really more, more about the idea. Um, so could, could you have built that business without the internet? Is there, is there something no. that, no? <laughs> <laughs> no, that not. I mean, one of the, I, I think the more interesting example here is Places, because we, um, we, we founded it in 2004, and we always knew that this is the kind of thing you want on your GPS handheld. Problem was, there was no GPS handhelds in 2004. So we kind of, we were basically thinking, how can we bridge that gap um, and still locate you? So we did it with a little piece of software on your, on your laptop. And of course, for mass adoption, that, that wasn't very practical because people don't take their laptop to a bar and then log on to a Wi-Fi, especially not in 2004. So for a normal user, it was hard you know, to be somewhere cool. You know, they could only be at home, at work, at home, at work. So, you know, and then, of course, you had some guys that jetted around the globe going to conferences and, like, locking on in all the cool airport lounges. And so it ended up being a fairly niche product until um, GPS products came out. And then, you know, then obviously it was clear. But we knew that all along. It's just nothing we could do, basically. Sometimes the, the timing is off. Um, yeah. Because you mentioned your kid. I mean, that's one thing, because we are talking about the next big thing. <laughs> I have to say, like my like my gut feeling, if I look at like the next couple of years, I have like you know a pretty good sensor where I think that might be interesting, like stuff around TV, for instance, uh, simply because of a matter of a fact uh, that everyone has one at home, and uh, as a matter of fact that with that you kind of like reach the audience of my older sister and stuff like that, or stuff like mobile payment. I'm super interested in because. Um, you know, every time you're in Japan, I mean, I can cry to see how, how I have another sister living in Tokyo, um, how she's paying with everything with a mobile phone. So, you know, I would say for the next couple of years, mobile payment, uh, social TV, stuff like that, I have like quite a good, some gut feeling what could be hard. Mm. But you mentioned your kids, that's something where for me is like a big question mark because it's so fundamental different how these yeah. folks uh, grow up. So I think the real challenge actually is really to, to think about, damn, for those folks who are really like the digital natives growing up, having no attachments to physical stuff, like not at all, <laughs> like not, you know, like, like my daughter, she, she, she never in a whole, she's five, she never had a DVD or a book or something in our household. Uh, I just had, I, I, I just had this, this, this thing where we have tea home at home and she's like watching her content whenever she likes to watch and we allow it to her. Yeah. And when we've been to a hotel, she was like looking at me like, hey, can I watch Caillou? And I was like, eh, you know what? <laughs> On this TV set, Caillou is not playing. And she was crying, like she was like, I felt like the, the, the worst dad on, on the planet. I was not able to explain to a five-year-old kid um, that it's about programming, about scheduling, uh, about TV stations, telling when to watch, because she didn't know it from home, from, from T home. So, you know, if you just think about it like in 20 years when she hopefully studied and is not married to a rock star and uh, is like a good kid and earns her own money, you know, I have no idea about what's then really like meaningful in her life because that's a complete different uh, area of people. No. Uh, so it's it's funny how you uh, how you mentioned uh, mobile payment. Um, so I don't know. It has Square has that come to Europe yet? No. We have we have okay. iSettle coming from from the Nordics. Oh yeah yeah okay. But anyways, what we've seen with Square in the US is that, uh, so Square is just a little dongle, a little device that you put on your iPhone, um, and basically creates you with an account, so you can take credit cards from everybody. Um, and suddenly we've seen this full democ democratization of who can actually take credit cards. So in my kids' schools, it, as a good old US tradition, there's a fundraiser every week. And, and suddenly they're really capable of taking people from everybody because now they can take credit cards. And 
I don't think they think one moment about the technology behind this. They just, it's just an enabler for them to do something in a completely different way. So it's a good example. Or you, can, or you can add something like My Taxi or Uber, you know, like just yeah, giving yeah, yeah. technology to, to some folks and creating a product out of it uh, with the payment. And I really like those models where you basically empower people with technology to do something and then yeah. just create a nice ecosystem around it. Um, I want to talk a little bit about money. <clears throat> it's always a good uh, subject because there's a there's a huge, there's huge marketing budgets out there that we all compete for. Like, um, it, it's all about the attention of the consumer. It used to be very much dominated by TV. Um, now we've seen uh, search take over a big part of the marketing budgets. We've seen, I think, so, uh, Facebook's uh, 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 revenue numbers is a good example of social taking over a lot more of the marketing budgets. But Nate, do you have any kind of where will we see marketing budgets go beyond, you know, go beyond social and search and so on? Um, so it's funny because it feels like interactive and social is taking over more of our marketing budget, and then you look at the numbers and it's not <laughs> necessarily getting what we might think of as its fair share. But they are growing a lot. Yeah, they, they are growing, and, and in the U.S. this year, about 20% of all marketing spend is going to go online. In Western Europe, it's going to look more like 15%. But that's compared to somewhere in the range of 35 to 40 percent of all media time going online. So there's definitely a lag there, and, uh, and a lot of folks have talked about when we when we catch up that lag. It's interesting too to look at Facebook's revenues, and they're making billions of dollars on advertising. But I, I certainly wouldn't call that um, social's impact on advertising because those are just crappy little banners, right? <laughs> and they're they're crappy little banners on a social network. But we've been doing that for years as well. So. Um, it's interesting because when, when, when I look at the startup space, a lot of the companies we work with are trying to rely primarily upon word of mouth. And when that works for them, it's incredibly powerful. Right? But even, even the agencies who are really good at creating word of mouth, and by the way, if you're going to be successful with word of mouth, working with an agency certainly helps. Um, nothing's free, not even word of mouth. Even the agencies that are really good at that stuff tell their clients that they're going to fail nine times out of ten. Um, so it's really hard to survive just on word of mouth. And, and really, when you, look at, um, when you look at the tools that the company should be using to get more attention, um, I think uh, search um, certainly is, is one that we know about, but I think a lot of companies are not necessarily using it to their best advantage. And this idea of, 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 uh, of, uh, un, uh, of unbranded search keywords is a way of reaching new audiences is one that works out really well. Mm. So um, you know, if you've got a competitor who's somewhat like you, then advertising against their search term is legal and very powerful, or even just advertising in the category uh, within Google is, is a pretty powerful way to, to start to collect people. Uh, and then, yeah, you, I mean, if you, if you have users who like what you're doing, then you've got to find ways to get them talking as well. But, yeah. um, but again, that's, that's not going to do it on its own. I mean, I think one thing, you know, that you mentioned Facebook, I think they, or I know that they haven't turned on their business model yet. I mean, what we see there, you know, the crappy banner ads, it's just a, it's just a appeasement for like, the marketplace. So people say like, they're actually making some money. That's not their model. You know, they basically haven't even found, or if they found it, at least not turned it on, their equivalent of AdWords. You know, AdWords was particularly smart because it was, you know, basically probably the first truly digital model that we've seen, you know, where you basically say, okay, if people are actively searching for something, it's information, it's, uh, it's not advertisement. You know, most of the advertisement we're still seeing online is display advertising. The targeting is might be better because you know more about the demographics, but it's still demographical targeting. I think, you know, what's happened with social was first wave with the social networks, right? So, oh, it's fun, you know, we can actually, there's six degrees of separation, Looks, look who I know through whom, you know? So that was like MySpace and then, you know, it kind of ended because people were like, okay, you know, I've, now I'm connected to a thousand people, what now? Facebook answered that question quite well by building the platform on top of it and basically saying, look, you know, now you can do really cool stuff. You can play games and, you know, some of the things that they wanted to do, like attack eBay, maybe didn't work out. But, you know, you could think about models like, you know, classifieds and things like that based on that social graph. But I think what we see happening now, and Eamon is part of that third wave, is try to understand better what people actually mean when they post. Yeah. The, ch the big challenge here is the cost of posting um, is high. So if I give people, you know, something to fill out where I say, hey, you know, when you talk about this place, you really have to disambiguate the place and tell me which McDonald's you mean and this and that. 
So it, you know, almost have to give people a form to make it really useful data, right? To, to be, have, have basically structured data instead of unstructured data like a tweet. But what we already see happening in Facebook with Open Graph, with the introduction of events, um, pages, um, places, that they understand more and more of what people are actually posting. And that's gonna be the big, the next big thing. Now I actually said it, I do know the next big thing. <laughs> um, is, uh, I think it's that you know, now with all the millions of posts that are out there, um, you need to try to get people to do it in a more structured manner without annoying them. So you understand what they're posting. And that's a big challenge that Twitter has. That's why they don't have a business model, because they simply don't know what is in the tweet. For them, it's a big, it's a, it's a blob, it's a black box. And Facebook is getting better at it. And once they have 500 million people sharing shit every day, all day, and they start understanding what it means, then you can really attack Google and say most of the searches are not fact-oriented, most of the searches are, are actually action-oriented. So if I want to, an answer to a question like what movie should I watch tonight or you know, what's the best sushi bar in Berlin, which hotel should I stay at, most people want that very simple answer. They don't want to search around on Google. That will be the business model around yeah. that. And it's interesting that you talk about why, why Facebook worked in that way and this, this, this trend we've had of adding utility to the social space because um, that piece of utility and actually taking something that could have just been cool and making it actually useful in some way, that's the kind of thing that I was talking about before, that if you focus on the technology that looks cool and it looks shiny, then that's great for a few months and people walk away and you need to add utility on top of it. I mean, the, the first time I, I did research on social networks, Friendster was the big social network. And it was, it, there was nothing, literally nothing to do on Friendster. It was this cool tool where you would sit down and you'd connect with your friends and technology enabled that and that was the end of it. And the reason MySpace was able to take over was they added something on top of that. Now it turns out it was just a different kind of cool, <laughs> right? It was music and I was living in Berlin when they launched in Germany and I got to go to the cool party at Lido to kick it off and see some good bands. But, but at the same time, Facebook was sitting there talking about us being a social platform, being a social utility that people could build things on top of. Mm. And in the end, that's, you know, that's what turned them into the big thing, was their ability to go from something that could have been tech focused and it could have been just, just fixating on the shiny object and figure out what the audience might want to do with it, what, what value the audience might get from it. And so, you know, when Felix talks about the next wave of social, I mean, this is what we're seeing. The companies that seem to be doing well here um, are the ones that are extending that utility even further. But, but, but Felix, are you already now, like, Eamon's been around for how long now? Uh, we launched uh, eight months ago. Okay, so are you already thinking about, are you thinking about your monetization model at all? Are you thinking about how you can start, you know, structuring your data in a way so you can monetize them? Well, that's the cool thing, the data is structured. <laughs> so that's the point. I mean, that's the point. The way you use it, um, every interaction with the system, every post, every Eamon, every dispute, every hell no, we call it, um, creates structure and creates lists and creates uh, utility. Um, in contrast to Twitter, where there's you know a bunch of companies trying to make sense of the fire hose in hindsight, which is super hard because you know if you say if uh, you know a lot of a lot of human language is very ambiguous, right? So in our case, you actually you can just click on the best new TV show in 2012 and you get a weighted list of what your friends think is the best TV show. That information is in Facebook. That information is in Twitter, but it's impossible for you to get out. So if Amen. Um, once you know it's it's a mass phenomenon, and, and there's there's millions and millions and millions of users. Basically, I think, for example, it could take uh, away a fair share of the search market from Google for sure. Mm. Um, it's just a matter of critical mass. So we think of it in stages. First, you have to figure out the formula. It has to be fun and addictive. Otherwise, you know, you're not getting traction. Then it becomes a utility. This is what we're mm -hmm. looking at starting now, where people actually go to him to say, well, now what movie should I watch? Um, and then obviously, you know, the model, the business model is super straightforward. If someone comes to you to say, what is the best TV show in 2012? Or what is the best, um, what is the best sushi bar in Prenzlauer Berg? Or, you know, what is the best mountain bike under a thousand euro? Monetization is obvious. It's just, it's just a matter of traction. So banner it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, I mean, the model will be super straightforward. It's going to be exactly like AdWords. We're not going to reinvent the wheel there. You just buy a keyword. You say if someone searches for best mountain bike under a thousand euros, um, and you want a part in that list, you can you know, buy a spot in the list, but the cool thing is um, it's super transparent. So if you get a lot of amens, you stay in it organically in that list because people say, oh yeah, that's really cool. If people hell know your product because they think it's actually shit and you put it in the wrong list, 
and but then, then you know you basically wasted your money. It's super transparent and fair. But then the success of Amen is also very binary. It's either or. You have to go out and get mass adoption, be a worldwide phenomenon before it become, can become a business model. That's the kind of stuff I like to do. Yeah. <laughs> right, so uh, yeah. Thomas, you have, a, you have a different business. Like, you know, you don't have to be a worldwide phenomenon for that to make, to become a business. You can, you can attract local customers from Germany and so on and build your business up, uh, uh, you know, one step at a time. How do, how do you see kind of, did you, did you assess kind of the, the opportunity of the market and, you know, uh, uh, your, comp your competition and pricing and so on in that market? Did you, have, did you went through these kind of, you know, thoughts before you launched your product? Well, first and foremost, we're a B2B model, so it's not a, we're not a B2C, we're not, uh, we're not a Facebook, we're not a, you know, not a mass product. We're a very tailored product. We, so the way it works, we listen to our customers where the where the flaws are, where the errors, where the, the opportunities are, and we assess them, and then we try to figure out the best way to actually you know support this business. So, but getting back to the question of what's the next big thing, I don't think it's a one pinpoint you can just nail it and say that's the big thing. First of all, because we don't know, we don't know, we don't foresee the future. Nobody saw Facebook coming that fast to where it is now, and um, but again, from the things you said about search, um, I don't think it's about searching. It's us searching for something. If I travel to Milan, for example, it's, it's not, I'm, I'm, in the future, I don't want to be looking for um, what's the best restaurant, what's the best museum, whatever. I, wanna, I want technology to tell me and facilitate my trip uh, rather than me actually you know, writing everything down and this is what I want to do. I want to, based on my history, obviously, if I provide that information, um, telling technology being an enabler, a facilitator along my trip. Uh, I want to get tips on my phone when I'm passing by a restaurant. This is something you might like. Uh, I want to walk past an art gallery telling me this is an interesting uh, exhibition that you might want to look at instead of me, you know, doing that actual search. Okay, I'm in the middle of here. What do I do? Okay, I search. GPS doesn't work. Internet doesn't work. You know, I want, okay, this needs to be more well coordinated. There's a lot of spaces that, needs to, that can be reinvented. I'm thinking of visiting a doctor, you know. Why is it so complicated to call and take so long? And it must be an easier way. Or traveling, why the whole traveling process needs to be reinvented. So I think it's a, a multiple trends falling into each other. It's social, local, mobile, of course, uh, but all of them solving again a big thing that will actually help us, you know, to cope better with, with our lives and you know focus on the things that are more interesting. And I think that the, the interesting stuff doesn't happen online. So I want technology to actually be a part of you know, making life less complicated, you know. Back then it was online banking. We couldn't live without online banking. I, don't, I can't remember the last time I went to the, uh, you know, the bank teller and, and actually did a, a transaction there, but it's impossible now. But these little things are the ones that I think are going to change, but it's multiple things happening at the same time. So, you, you... whoa. <laughs> Hello, legs. Hello. hello. So I, I've got the Tetris pan. Sorry, I, I, I rule. Um, no, we're going to open up to the audience for some questions because we're running out of time. So if you have a burning question, uh, we need... Actually, you've had the mic far too much. I'm taking that away. <laughs> Take that away. Take that to the audience. Do, put your hand up if you have a question here. I have a question. Where are all the women, the female entrepreneurs? Are there any female entrepreneurs in the audience? Wow. That is sad. No female entrepreneurs. Okay, we have a few at the back, thank God. Whew. Well, I'm not the only one. All right, so do you have a question down here? No, nobody has a question? This man has a question here. Let's get him the mic. Are you taking my Tetris pen? <laughs> yeah. I think uh, you have to answer this question. You haven't had enough mic time. <laughs> uh, thank you, great panel. Um, Having lived in, in San Francisco and worked there for the past 15 years and just returning, um, I'm wondering, and having experienced the VC culture firsthand with all the ups and downs, you know, coming back to Germany, how hard is it to raise money for a startup in Germany? And also talk to a few companies out there who you know, have great products and tractions and 90,000 users and, and they said, oh, if we had a half a million euros, you know, we would take the next step. Uh, how hard is it? Yeah, I think I can answer that question. Yay! <laughs> uh, it's a very good point, you know. If, if, you, li if, if you lived in, in uh, San Francisco, I, I lived there as well, and 
and I was sort of like on, on, on the business side, I was raised by Kevin O'Connor and Dwight Merriman, you know, the, the founders of, of DoubleClick, and uh, for, for me it was, it was a great experience, you know, because I, I, I felt like I, I got balanced in a way that me being a German, German, you know, being precise, nitty gritty, and defining everything, always trying to invent the Eier legen the Wollmich you know, and, and, um, and then um, working with guys like Kevin O'Connor and, and, and Dwight Merriman taught me that, hey, there's, there, there should be a balance, you know, of, of uh, understanding there's an opportunity, you know, and, and then go for it if you feel you're in the right spot, okay? And that's something definitely in Germany where um, the majority, the vast majority of, of all the guys who are sitting on money, you know, they, they, they take it simply too hard, you know. They, they are trying to, to understand the last final nitty gritty detail and they, 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 ha they have to be 110% sure that this is going to work out. And, and I think it's not the right balance, you know. You have, to, you have to really understand this is an opportunity for me. Yes, I'm going to go for it. I know I'm going to make mistakes, but I'm going to learn from these mistakes. And so that's where I, I definitely still believe that the, the vast majority of the German investors are really much, uh, much too slow, way too slow. Good question. And also just leading on for that, if you have another question, put your hand up and we'll get you the mic. I don't see anyone yet. But um, just leading on from that, you know, uh, I think crowdfunding has changed the model of entrepreneurship. You know, you used to go for a, for a big A round to venture capitalists. Now in Silicon Valley, at least, there are, there's a new accelerator popping up every day. It's great that Deutsche Telekom is setting up this accelerator. But because the cost of innovation is coming down so much, how low does it go? I mean, my grandma can now build an iPhone app, but what is the, what is the lowest common denominator? What, what, how does that change the model of entrepreneurship? I don't know if I can <laughs> answer that question <laughs> specifically, but just because you mentioned the cost and we just had the question about uh, the VCs. I mean, what I clearly see is um, it's, it's easy to get uh, capital from business angels. I think that's, I don't know, uh, I guess Felix had it, but also like with a bigger round. Uh, but what, what I think interesting is like there's definitely um, uh, like a need for something in between like the business angels and the typical VCs because was, what, what I'm seeing in the market a lot is that a, a typical VC, most ideas are still then too small, and for, for business angels it becomes too expensive. So let's say with 100K, so coming back to your point, with 100K, yes, you can build a great app, you can get it into the app store, you can hire some cool people, you have a nice office in Berlin, that's possible, but um, you're still, uh, you know, you still, you don't have enough traction. <laughs> you're probably too small for a big VC, and then you have like this, uh, yeah, like this big hole where basically now you actually would need capital to uh, to make some buzz or to hire some smart people so to, to do some biz dev, to do an Android version or whatsoever. So what I see in the market, that's currently like a, um, a very big demand. So accelerator programs are, I think, quite interesting because they might be able to 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 bridge that. Also, uh, something about monetization. You know, everybody's talking about like monetization, if you have like the next big thing, how is it going to monetize? Yeah. Um, Who cares I, about money when you've got data, right? Um, not really. I mean, the, 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 the point is that before you start to seriously think about monetization, is I, I think you have to, especially in these days, you have to think about where's the actual value for whom. And, and, and I think that, that looking at social, you know, why is social so big? Very simple, because it's social. You know, we, we've been uh, technology centric for such a long period of time and right now uh, a couple of companies built some tools that are bringing people together and what does it actually mean you know and I think that um, generally uh, generous, uh, generally uh, humans are tending towards taking something or pushing something too hard for a bit too long and suddenly it's like in a car you you see that you, you pushed it into the wrong direction and you have to over, oversteer to get it back in track you know and, and I think we're, we're at a point where in especially in social you know um, we, we have great tools we have a phenomenal reach you know uh, we, we can collect data but but what companies seriously have to think about is where's the value for the user and think differently okay we got a question down here yeah, for the tech guys on the panel, you uh, were talking earlier about time to market and avoiding distractions and building for a bunch of different platforms, but one of the biggest challenges I see for tech companies is actually getting enough talent and that being one of the biggest limiting factors even more than uh, funding. So 
Do you guys have any advice on what you're doing on that? I know that Zendesk moved to San Francisco, but uh, even there, they're, they're having this problem as well, right? How do you get talent in Germany? Are you based here? Okay. How do you get talent in Germany? <laughs> there, I don't think there's a simple rule to that, because if we all knew that rule, we'd probably uh, be all... But I, I personally think is, is surrounding yourself with smart people, because smart people know smart people. And uh, it's just building an, a, an interesting network. It's being at events like this, is uh, opening discussions and speaking to, to interesting business models and people behind the, those business models. But there's no one place to go where you find talent. And if you look in Berlin, developers are gone. <laughs> Um, it, it's a challenge, but, uh, but it's still, it's, it's all about, you know, connecting and networking. And now it's possible across borders, so, you know, why not take that chance? I think Berlin right now has a good, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a bad place to be in terms of getting people here. I mean, you can even go as far as going to San Francisco and, you know, telling people, you know, you just got your first child, want to get out of the red race for two or three years, why don't you come to Berlin? Now there's actually cool jobs here. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's, that's an opportunity, I and mean, there is some people that want to get out of that for, for a while, but I mean, the, the, the bigger problem, and that's why I disagree a little bit with the lack of money in Berlin, is, is that we've, we've switched in Berlin from, like, nothing to now, you know, pretending to be Silicon Valley, but um, both quality entrepreneurs and, you know, um, top-notch people are still lacking. That's, I mean, it's coming, but at the moment, there's less talent, less good companies, less um, quality entrepreneurs that there is money. The money is desperately looking for, for good people to invest in. It's just that there's a bunch of shit out there because everyone and their moms wants to do a startup. I mean, it's good, it's really good, don't get me wrong, because it, 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 there was like a click in German mentality towards like, oh, now all of a sudden, you know, young people want to build companies, but you know, both the talent and their experience, and, and that's maybe a little bit lacking still. All the big funds want to invest here, they all come here every week and they're like, do you know any good company, do you know any good company? You know, where's the deal flow? But, you know, it's, it's just there's not that many great, especially more American style models, more social stuff. And it's, it's, it's starting, but there's also a lot of shit, you know. So I agree. Don't, don't get me wrong. What I mean is, like, I think you, you have great access to business angels, and I think it's, it's, it's quite possible to get, like, a good uh, start seed finance round. But I think it's incredibly challenging still, like, to get something between 500K and, and, and 1.5 million from uh, typical, like, a big VCs. Because for them, you're, I mean, you're a big exception, I know, but, like... He talks too much anyway. <laughs> uh, and actually, I think being in the valley is actually detrimental in some way because you're competing, you know, with the likes of Google and Facebook. I mean, they're demanding $200,000 salaries straight out of Stanford. So in a way, being in Berlin and Europe, you have pick of the bunch. Would you agree? Well, I think you mentioned that we moved to San Francisco. And, and, but I think the, the, the talent, you know, also means experience. And what we see in, in, in San Francisco, that if we want to hire experienced people that have tried building up the data center of Google or Yahoo or, you know, have real experience scaling a business and so on, like, there's just, you just find a lot more of those people in areas, in hubs, where there's a lot of technology companies. Um, so, you, know, you, 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 can't, you can't run away from that. Of course, there's not the same level of experience here in Berlin. Um, okay. Hi, um, thanks for a nice discussion so far. My question concerns human capital as well. Not hiring people, but more like the, the team of founders. So how important do you see it? For example, if Mark Zuckerberg now would go off Facebook and found something that is absolute crap, like literally there's no business model, there's no way of monetizing, he would still probably find a VC that would give him millions of dollars just because of the name and because he has proven himself as someone who can do something and he's a fast mover. So how important? Or how do you see there's a problem if like there's a team of new founders that haven't had any chance to be founded or to have founded any kind of company? Um, do you see there's a problem to find funding, especially in Germany? So when you're a nobody, how do you get funding? Well, if you don't if you don't have a network, if you don't have a name, then you need traction. You need to show that you have a model that works. You know, you need to go out and build your business. Um, so, uh, of course, if you've proven already that you can build a business and get traction, it's a lot easier to raise money. If you haven't built a business before, if you don't have a reputation, if you don't have a network, you need to build a business that shows traction to, to raise money. 
Is there anything you can put in your deck that uh, makes you attractive? Like, not nude photos, but, you know, something no. like... That doesn't work. No, um, uh, so... You, you're, I, you're an investor, right? You're an angel investor. No, I don't okay. invest. But if you pitch, if you pitch to a VC, um, like making sure that that VC's portfolio company is actually using your product, that's a great way for them to get some... They can call some people they know and trust and get their uh, direct input on your product. And I was speaking to Dave McClure, who's um, got 500 startups in Silicon Valley, you know, he gets sent like hundreds and hundreds of pitches, pitch decks every week. And he says the first thing he skips to is the bio of each founder because he wants to know, you know, he's accepting these people into his accelerator, he's working with them. You know, he wants to know a little bit about the founders versus, you know, spewing out numbers. So, I think... But, uh, but um, you know, maybe sometimes the business angels helps. I mean, I'm not, not making advertising for, for those <laughs> folks, but the thing is like, when, when you're really talking about uh, like a team that didn't have experience before, uh, you know, if they are able to convince a bunch of, of interesting business angels, that might be helpful. I mean, I've seen that in the past. I've seen it, for instance, with, with Kite, and, and Daniel is an, an absolutely amazing uh, guy, but, but he came from Philips. He definitely didn't have a track record in building up a company, but he actually surrounded some really cool people around him that, uh, that are advising him, that, that give him support, and that was actually like, you know, like a, a good sign for a VC then to trust him. I think most important is, is, is to, to have a very clear uh, and ambitious vision and, and you should be, you should know how to get there. Um, um, none of us is, is a hero, no? you, you can't really do everything by yourself and, and I think it, it, it really comes down to admitting uh, what weaknesses you have and adding the right people to it. And, and I think that we, we're looking at this uh, hoop farm concept, you know, I think it's that there's, there are some guys uh, who, who understand um, uh, ideas and who are able to, to give you some good kickstart, you know, if you're, if you're lacking some resources. So. so I don't think anyone else has any last questions, but uh, just to round up, I think we've heard that the, the, the next big thing is data, basically. It's data sets, big data. I think Chris Sacco was speaking at the web a couple of years ago and he said, data is porn. So uh, would you guys agree with that sentiment? Well, it's easier for a B to C than for a B to B, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, this is the last time <laughs> you're getting the mic. Yes, I'll, I'll take it. Um, it no, I mean data is incredibly important. But one of the things that Felix said earlier was um, Facebook hasn't flipped the switch on its AdSense model, and and that this is something that's for instance, social companies can do. That's actually a concern for me when I see companies focusing on that because actually Facebook has flipped the switch on their AdSense model and it doesn't work as well as Google's AdSense model because it's a completely different kind of data, right? Google's data works rid of because it's what John Mattel calls a database of intention. And marketers put a high value on knowing what a consumer intends to do, what they intend to buy. What Facebook have, has isn't a database of intention, it's a database of affinity. Right? And affinity is not nearly as highly valued by marketers. Now, it's really important. It's important enough that Google keeps trying and trying and trying to start a social network, um, not because they want a social network, because they want the social data. But it turns out that when Facebook tried to use this data of affinity in the same way that Google had been using the, the database of intentions, it simply didn't work as well. So Facebook's big enough, right? A billion people spending trillions of minutes that there's something in there for them. They can make $3 billion off it, but I, I don't know that that's gonna work for everyone else in the social space. And the data is incredibly important, but relying just on that as the future business model does, does frighten me a little bit. All right, so a big round of applause for uh, Mikhail and all of our panelists. And uh, I'm sure you'll be around for questions uh, in a minute, and uh, you're going to be coming back this afternoon for the startup uh, demo pitch, right? Of course. Right. Okay. Well, thank you very much.